All right, well, we are continuing our series uh, as we go 66 books in 52 weeks. Now, of course, uh, we'll have to double up on a few weeks on some of the books of the Bible, but tonight we are up to the book of Numbers. And again, I'll remind you, for, for those that are on Zoom or if you're watching on YouTube later, that we have these outlines available, these uh, summaries of every book of the New Testament. It's a one-page summary, and you can uh, pick these up here at the church. We have the printed versions of these. You can also purchase the digital copy, the PDF of those. We cannot distribute those digitally in, in that way, but I wanted to let you know those are available. And again, the, the idea behind this is to just do a flyover of each one of these books. And the other thing you'll notice is you'll see as we go through each one of these how 66 books, individual books, become one complete story. The story of God's redeeming grace. And it's interesting how in each of these books, in some way, whether concealed or revealed, uh, you will see... Uh, Jesus in those um, you will see Jesus revealed uh, in each one of these books in some ways Jesus is in there uh, it's either in a, in a shadow of something greater to come or a prophecy or something like that so let's uh, let's jump right in here to the book of numbers and uh, so uh, now you can see we've kind of got a, a little bit of a system here uh, start off, we're just going to show the overview of the book of Numbers, and the overview is this. It's the fourth book of the Bible. Uh, it's got 36 chapters in it, and it is the type of book it is. It is history or uh, Pentateuch, which simply means five, the first one of the first five books of the Bible. And so uh, the overview here also, you can see the name of the book comes from the Lord's instructions to count the Israelite males who were able to go into war. Uh, and so there's, that's where you get that number. There's the numbering. There's actually a couple of numberings you'll find in this book. And so that brings us down to the structure of the book. Uh, you see here, uh, this is on, on that sheet that you can, uh, we have that are printed out. You can uh, reference later here. And so you have the first 10 chapters here according to this structure on the one-page overview. Israel's preparing to believe Mount Sinai. And uh, then uh, they complete the tabernacle and do some things there. And then from there, they, be, they move up to Kadesh. Uh, and there is where you see the complaining and some other things that are taking place there. And there's all these little adventures, I should say, uh, as they make their way along. And then as they're in Kadesh, there is a rebellion there. And uh, this is where the Israelites uh, are told that they're going to have to continue to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The one generation will not be allowed into the promised land. Then you have the journey from Kadesh to Moab. And I'll show you that on a map a little bit later. And what this is, you're, close, you're getting closer and closer to the promised land or Canaan. Uh, as, and you'll, I'll show you that on a map a little later. And then uh, as they're in Moab, that's not too far, making their way towards the Jordan River. Uh, they're anticipating taking the promised land, and there's some other prophecies, there's some other instructions that are there. And then there's just some miscellaneous things that are tie up the end of the book in chapters 33 through uh, 36. And so uh, we'll, we'll look through some of these things here. So let's just see what is the purpose of the book of numbers and on your outline there uh, you'll see the purpose uh, num of numbers numbers was written to tell the story of how israel uh, prepared to enter the promised land how they sinned and how they were punished and how they prepared to try again so this is a wandering thing. It's a numbering of the fighting men. This is where you get the number from. But it's really the account in the history of Israel, them preparing to enter into uh, the promised land. So that's on your outline there. Now, as we're continuing here, we'll, we'll go on down here and just we'll, we'll get to the division of the book here in just a, a moment here. Again, it's the, it's the tragic story of the unbelief of God's people. I wish this was like a real uplifting book. But uh, you still, in the, in the midst of this, you still see 
the gospel concealed in here in one very vivid uh, place here. And so it begins with God's people at the foot of Mount Sinai. That's where they had gotten the Ten Commandments. They had first constructed the tabernacle. They received God's laws there. And then uh, they took a census to determine the, the amount of men that were fit for military service. That's where you get the title Numbers. And so uh, if you're looking from the end of Exodus to the beginning of Numbers, there's about a one-month period between the end of the events in the book of Exodus to the beginning of the events in the book of Numbers. So let's just go through this so you can see what happens. Uh, the first thing that happens in the division of the book you have, it begins with the old generation. That's Moses, all of those people who were 20 years and older when they crossed over the Red Sea. So that is the cutoff of the older generation. So anybody that was 20 years or older when they crossed over the Red Sea coming out of Egypt, they died in the wilderness and the younger generation, uh, except for two people that were the older generation, only two people out of the older generation made it over to the promised land. The rest died along the way in the wilderness there. So we start with the older generation and uh, the next part here is the numbering, chapters one through four. And uh, I'll read to you from this uh, and Numbers 1, beginning in verses, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai. The tent of meeting would have been the tabernacle there. So, in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. He said, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name, one by one, you and Aaron are to number by their divisions all men in Israel uh, 20 years or more who are able to serve in the army. And so there's where we get this, this cutoff there. So I want to stop right there and uh, answer a question that came up just a few weeks ago. Uh, somebody asked the question, I think it was somebody on Zoom, they asked the question, can you explain the division of the 12 tribes of Israel, of how that works out. Because sometimes if you see all of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you look at the 12 sons of Jacob, uh, it, sometimes it doesn't look the same as the names that are, you see on the map of Canaan. And how does that all work out? So I want to just show that to you right now. So we're going to list out the 12 tribes. So let's get our, head, just get our heads around that understanding this is kind of going back in time a little bit. So in the book of Genesis, we learned about Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. Then Abraham had Isaac. And then Isaac, he had Jacob. Jacob was also called Israel. So the tribes of Israel. So his name is also Israel. So that's where you get that name from. So now these are different customs, different times. Uh, back in that time, it was the practice of many of them to have multiple wives. This does not mean that God was condoning the fact that they had the multiple wives and do this. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the times when you see these multiple wives and these things, it, it ends up, it always reads like a cautionary tale and a dysfunctional family. And that was true when you see this family line here. So here's the family line. Now, this is this, these are the sons of Jacob, all right, that that make up the 12 tribes. So you have the sons of Leah, and that was uh, uh, the first wife of, uh, of Jacob, and that was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, all right? And then you remember, there was the sister, Rachel. Now he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. But remember, he waited for the two sisters. There was this whole thing about that, so Leah had all of those sons, and then Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. So now here's where things start to get a little crazy from our standpoint here, if you look at how the families lined up. So the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid. All right, so you have Dan and Naphtali. All right, then from here you have the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. So there you have uh, these 12 sons 
from Jacob. From there, you get the 12 tribes of Israel. But that again, if you look at just those names, those aren't the way it's exactly listed on the map. If you're looking for all the, the land areas when they finally get over into Canaan. So we'll list them out here. And again, this is on your outline there too. So here is how they are listed out. You have Reuben, Simeon. Now Levi, you won't see a tribe of Levi on a, on a map because those were the, that was the priestly tribe. They had other uh, ways that they were able, they were able to uh, have certain areas and cities and things like that. Then you had Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Benjamin. And then you'll notice if you ever look at a map of Israel, there's no tribe of Joseph. You know, he was the one. So how, how did that happen? Well, from Joseph, there were two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so Ephraim and Manasseh, they make up two half tribes of Israel. So that's where you get the 12 tribes uh, of Israel there. So, um, so you can, if you're ever looking on a map and you want to match that up, you can use that little list that's on your outline there uh, and you can see how that works. So they're numbering all of the males to take in a census to see who is fit for war and it's coming from these 12 tribes and uh, also when they would uh, have the tabernacle when it would be put up the 12 tribes had certain places ways that they would be arranged all the way around the the tent of meeting or the tabernacle and so this is this is the picture of the nation of israel wandering in the desert eventually you'll see them on a map in canaan so so we had the old generation, chapters 1 through 14. There you had the numbering. And then um, we'll uh, move on into the instructions here. That's, uh, so that's chapters 5 through 9 here. So um, the, the chapters, these chapters here contain instructions on morality, worship, offerings, the priesthood, the tabernacle. So you get some more instructions there. Some of it might overlap with some of the things you might read in, uh, in Leviticus. One interesting one, I just put this uh, scripture passage there, um, and it's, uh, it says Numbers 1 on the, uh, uh, on the screen. It's actually Numbers 6, chapters uh, uh, 1 through 8 there, I believe. But uh, I, you know, wait a minute, I have it right there. Numbers 6, 1 through 8. Uh, so uh, let me just read this. This was uh, an interesting act of worship called the Nazarite vow. So I'll just read you this from number six, one through eight. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord as a Nazarite, he must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or from other fermented drink. He must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as he is a Nazarite, he must not eat, not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins. During the entire period of his vow of separation, no razor may be used on his head. He must be holy until the period of his separation to the Lord is over. He must let the hair of his head grow long throughout the period of separation to the Lord. He must not go near a dead body, even if his own father or mother or brother or sister dies, he must not make himself ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of his separation to God uh, is on his head. Throughout the period uh, of separation, he is consecrated to the Lord. So this was a, kind of an odd to us, an odd custom in the, that just applied to this time. It was a Nazarite vow. Now, uh, out loud here, can anybody think of a person that would fit the description of somebody who took a Nazarite vow. Can you think of somebody, I'm thinking of an Old Testament person. It would have been Samson. And so, uh, you know, a razor never cut his head, touched his head. His, his parents actually set him apart as a Nazarite. And so he never cut his hair. Uh, so uh, he had some personal flaws and all of that thing, but, uh, but you know, his, his strength came from the Lord. It, it, they had taken this vow. Uh, but did you know that there was an individual that took a Nazarite vow in the New Testament? And that would have been the Apostle Paul. 
In Acts chapter 18 and verse 18, I'll read this here. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at, at Centria because of a vow he had taken. Now, uh, that's interesting there. So he was a Jew. You could take a vow voluntarily uh, as a Nazarite. It was just a vow of separation. And, and many times it was just something to set something apart. Maybe you just wanted to pray about something specifically for a while. Um, much like fasting, kind of that long. So that was something you could do um, along that line. Um, another uh, thing of interest here, and that's in Numbers uh, 9.15 and following there, is how God guided the Israelites during this time. So imagine you're living in the time of the book of Numbers. Numbers 9.15, on the day uh, the tabernacle, uh, on the day of the tabernacle, the tent of testimony was set up. The cloud covered it. So again, the presence of God in the middle of his people. The people camped all around by the different tribes. Uh, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it at night, and it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the clouds settled, the Israelites encamped. So how did they know where to go next? They followed the cloud. It was the presence of God. I would love to have seen that. It's just kind of an amazing thing. God guiding them in this way. And so this shows the dramatic way in which God guided his people and how they, how they followed his instructions and sometimes didn't follow his instructions. So... All right, I'm kind of watching the time. I think we're doing good. Okay, so we're down to the journeys now. That's chapters 10 through 14 here. So when the Israelites set out from Mount Sinai, God gave Moses some very, very specific instructions as to how it was to take place. So when, when they set out to travel, let me just read this here. This is Numbers 10, 1 through 6. And just try to push yourself Pretend like you're there and imagine what this would be like. The Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community, community together and for having the camp set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If only one is sounded, the leaders of the heads of the clans of Israel are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be a signal for setting out. The cloud was a guide, but the trumpet blast helped organize Israel clan by clan. So they, this is how they uh, set out. I guess today uh, they would just get a mass text message or something and say, okay, it's time to head out. Let's go. <laughs> so, but this is what they did. And so... This is their traveling. This is the life they're in right now. So they're traveling towards the promised land from Egypt, out in the desert, down to Sinai, making their way towards the promised land. And as they travel towards the promised land, the people, believe it or not, began to complain. Uh, so they began to complain. Have you ever known of a person to complain? No, nobody's ever complained. That's right. So, uh, so I've got a little chart here I'm going to show you, and it shows you what the people were complaining about in some of these chapters here. So we'll look here. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom this in a little bit. There's one thing where some text got sent out there but uh, got bumped off, but that's okay. We'll get through this. So Numbers 11.1, 1, what was the complaint? They complained about the hardships. And what was the sin of that? They were complaining about their problems that are praying to God about their problems. Have we ever done that? <laughs> uh, I've, I've never been guilty of that. Well, no, now I'm going to be guilty of lying, right? <laughs> so be careful. All right, so you had the result. Thousands of people were destroyed when God sent a plague of fire to punish them. Wow, that just seems kind of harsh. These were some harsh times back in that day. Numbers 11.4, they, they complained about the lack of meat. And so they lusted after things they didn't have. They had, God gave them manna. He fed them 
uh, with this miraculous thing would, that kind of show up like uh, dew in the morning and they would gather it up. It was like a bread type thing. But after a while, I guess they got sick of having manna sandwiches and manna loaf and manna whatever, you know, they, uh, and they started to complain and um, God sent quail, but as the people began to eat, he struck them with a plague. So there was a, there was a plague that struck them in Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Um, after being stuck in the desert, facing giants of the promised land, uh, and they were wishing to just to go back. You know, sometimes they would say, but didn't we have it better in Egypt? Thing, you hear that kind of complaining, that type of thing. They openly rebelled against God's leaders and failed to trust in God's promises. That he was, you know, he, you think about this. They saw, um, they saw the Red Sea part. They saw the fire by night and the cloud by day every day. And yet, they still complain. That says a little bit about human nature. Now, the truth is, as believers in Christ, we have contact, we understand about the risen Lord. And you know what? Human nature being what it is, sometimes we might take our eye off the mark and find ourselves complaining or finding ourselves in despair and worry and those things. So, all of those who complained were not allowed to enter the promised land. They, they wandered in the desert until they died. So anybody who was over the age of 20 crossing the Red Sea, except for Joshua and Caleb, did not end up crossing the Jordan River into Canaan at the beginning of the book of Joshua there. So there's, there's that. Uh, so uh, it's kind of, kind of an interesting thing here to... Uh, uh, to go through so they began to complain all that time i would say uh it could be whining would be what they were doing as, as well and uh you know we're all good at that too uh human nature being what it is and so uh so i'm going to read to you from numbers 14 beginning in verse uh 27 uh the lord said uh how long will this wicked community grumble against me I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall, every one of you 20 years or old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter into the land I swore uplifted, uh, with uplifted hand uh, to make your home except for Caleb, son of Jephunneh, uh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would not be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. So this is the story of Numbers. Numbers. All of Moses' generation, including Moses, died out. And under the leadership of Joshua, uh, they, they came in to take over the promised land. What's that again? Oh, that was from um, uh, Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 27. And I think that might be on the outline there, too. Yeah, so so uh, uh, that's, uh, yeah, just before the chart there. So, And it's, well, it was grumbling and a lack of faith. And uh, there was just a number of things. They refused to go into the promised land. And uh, when Joshua and Caleb went in and said, we can do this, and the people refused to have faith to believe that God was going to do what he could do. And, and so he said, well, you're going to wander. And you, if you want to complain you, and you think you're going to die in the desert, well, you can have your way about it. So that was kind of how it went. Moses didn't die in Numbers, though, did he? No, we, we'll read about that near the end of uh, Deuteronomy. The question was, did that Moses die in Numbers? And no, we'll, we'll read about that. Uh, Moses gives his farewell speech in the book of Deuteronomy. So we'll, we'll get that. And that's basically what the book of Deuteronomy is. So, so now we're up to the, the wilderness wanderings in chapters 15 through 20. So, um, and, uh, and along with the wilderness wanderings, you're always getting this from time to time, additional regulations, stuff that they had to live by. Most of it was just kind of housekeeping for, for the Israelites in that day. Um, in chapter 15, God gave us some more commandments uh, concerning various offerings, 
Uh, things like putting tassels on their garments, a sign to remind Israel to be faithful to God's command, just little things like that. And it's interesting to read through. Now, this is where it's important to understand the context of a book that you're reading. You know, if you just opened up to that and started reading it, you would think, what, is it, how, what does this have to do with me? But if you understand the context of it, you can say, okay, this is just part of a bigger picture it might not apply to me directly today, but I can see, okay, God is working a bigger picture here. So that brings us to rebellion against Moses, and that's in chapter 16. And so uh, in chapter 16, there were three men, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who rose up against Moses, and uh, they were actually rebelling against the Lord is what they were doing. So again, these were harsh times. Long story short, 250 people were swallowed up into the ground as a result of the rebellion, if you can imagine that. And there were something like 14,000 people who died from a plague. So that's, that happened during that time. Uh, these were just uh, quite significant, amazing accounts of things that are taking place. Then you have a listing of the duties of the priest and the Levites. More regulations, more stuff that they are supposed to do. Um, I'm going to just read to you from Numbers 18, verses 5 through 7. And this is just some of the instructions that was given to them. You are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary, Numbers 18, 5 through 7, and the altar so that uh, wrath will not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of meeting. But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I am giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary must be put to death. Now again, very harsh. What God is doing here though, oftentimes is showing the seriousness of rebelling against him and showing, illustrating very vividly now as we look at this, uh, very vividly that we are to do God's things, God's ways. We are to be a separate people. So the Israelites are to be separate. He had very specific instructions. Uh, and so, yes, you see the judgment and even the wrath of God, but through this you also see uh, the grace of God. So I think it's letter D there. We get to passing the mantle. Uh, so, uh, this is Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13, around in there. It records a time where the Israelites were without water and began to quarrel with Moses. Now, Moses had to have a lot of patience through this, too, to deal with people that were complaining. You know, I mean, um, I, I imagine he would just say, what more do you want? You just crossed the Red Sea, you got a fire and a cloud, you got all this stuff going on. Um, so, but... Here in chapter 20, uh, the Israelites were without water, began to quarrel with Moses. God told Moses to take his staff, gather the people together, and speak to the rock before their eyes. He was in front of this rock. He told them to speak to the rock before their eyes so the water would come out. Well, Moses had just had enough of these complaining people, and so he didn't speak as God said. He just struck the rock. So the idea was he struck the rock twice without giving credit to the Lord. Now, as a result of this, Moses ended up not being allowed to go over in the promised land. Uh, he was greatly honored, continues to be greatly honored in his service, but uh, he didn't make his way on over. And then you have uh, the death of Aaron, uh, his older brother recorded in that chapter, who was the first priest. Aaron's garments were placed on his son Eleazar, and Eleazar became the new high priest. We're passing the mantle from one generation to another here. Moses is still living at this time. And then we get into the new generation. A new generation is coming up here. We're making our way to the promised land here. So chapters 21 through 26 is that. We have some of the new journeys here. Now, uh, there are a few interesting things that take place here, and I'll talk about this more in detail. One of the things that takes place during this period was uh, the bronze snake. 
Israel sinned against God, then uh, he, and once they sinned against God, God sent a plague of snakes. They were biting them. And then uh, in order for the cure for this plague, uh, they were instructed to, to build a bronze serpent, a bronze snake, and hold it up. And the people were to look up at the bronze serpent, and then they would be healed from their snake bites and all of that. That bronze serpent uh, was, uh, now serves as a symbol of medicine. So you see the medical symbol of the logo. It, it, the, origin, the origin is from that. You also have, during this period of things that happened, is Balaam and the talking donkey. So you don't get that in the New Testament. You don't get talking donkeys you know, in the New Testament. So you get Balaam and the talking So this was a man who worked as an operative for Balak, who was the king of the Moabites. But he was detained when his donkey saw an angel and talked to him. And, and so it's a kind of an interesting thing here. So that's an interesting thing to, to look at. So we're going to look here a little bit at... Uh, at the map here. Now let me um, let me do this here, and I'm going to get to where I can kind of put my cursor over the map, and hopefully you can see that. Okay, yeah, it's showing up here. So let's just review here. If you can see my little cursor is moving around there, that is kind of where the Israelites start. They go, they cross the Red Sea, they go down here. They're at Mount Sinai. They get the Ten Commandments. They build the tabernacle. Then they start their wandering. Uh, there's Kadesh Barnea. That is a place where they rebelled against, against the Lord and against Moses. And they end up wandering. And so now they're, they're making their way through. They're continuing to, to wander. They end up in Moab. So this is uh, the Moabites and things. And so this is where they're making their way. And you can see uh, over here is Jericho. Who was it that fought the battle of Jericho? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came and tumbling down. So it's Joshua, you know, the one of the, uh, one of the two who was uh, under uh, the age of 20, uh, that, that was over the age of 20, uh, that uh, made it to here. And he, he was the one that got them the crossover. So by the time they get here, and Joshua had taken over, you know, Moses had died, and the whole other generation had died. So that is the journey uh, that they had been taking uh, for all that time. So it gives you just an overview of, of just the how, where they were going. For me, it helps me to see on a map uh, where, where they were going here. So, all right. Yes, they did. Well, that's, there's a reason it's called the wandering. <laughs> they were traveling in circles there all over. So. so with the new generation came a new numbering uh, in there. So you see the next generation, they're preparing to enter the promised land. And they, you know, there's going to be battles involved in this. You know, the first one was the Battle of Jericho. Uh, and they had to kind of number, okay, how many fighting men do we have here? That's what they were getting to. And then, uh, believe it or not, in verse, uh, uh, they've got some more, verses 28 through 36, the new instructions. Now, here we see more instructions on the law, sacrifices. Then we have instructions on the boundaries of Canaan, the land that they're going to be entering into uh, once uh, you know, Moses passes away and Joshua is taken over as the leader. And so you have worship, instructions on worship. So uh, sometimes people get bogged down in numbers because of all of these regulations that are in there. But what he's doing, he's just dealing with this nation. Okay, here's how you got to do stuff um, as, you're, as you're in this nation here. So um, what I want to do now is get into making some applications here. So let's say, how do we apply this to life, what we've learned here in Numbers? And how do we find Jesus in the book of Numbers? So uh, first of all, the book of Numbers teaches us simply about trusting God. Uh, we're taught to trust God in spite of appearances. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, the Israelites decided they rebelled and said, hey, we're not going to go take over the promised land quite yet. Uh, they didn't want to go fight that battle and cross over from Moab and, 
and go in to, to fight. Uh, and they, they refuse and God calls them to wander because remember there was a, uh, you might remember the account, there were 12 spies that were sent to go in and spy on the land of Canaan, cross over the river. Uh, 10 of them came back and gave a bad report. Hey, there's giants in the land. We can't defeat these people. They've got smart missiles. They've got all kind of things. They've got uh, all kind of weapons, you know, and, um, and so there's no way we can defeat them. Joshua and Caleb came back and they said, no, wait a minute, we can do this. God's on our side. God's bigger than all these giants. We can take care of this. God, God uh, put this into our hands. Well, who do you think the people listen to? They listen to the 10 that didn't want to go through. And so it's the, we you have this application of trusting God. God had made a promise. He had miraculously delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Ten plagues. I mean, how many plagues do you need to be convinced that God is doing something miraculous here? Then after that, he guided them with a fire by night and a cloud by day, and he helped them cross through miraculously through the Red Sea, destroying the greatest fighting army in the world at that time, the Egyptian army. Uh, can you imagine watching that? Um, and then uh, from there on, the, the, still you had the cloud and the fire and all of that. And, and then you had even the judgments of God opening up the ground and all of these things, all of these after the rebellions. And, and time and time again, uh, they refused to trust God in spite of, of the evidence here. So the book of Numbers teaches us about trusting God. And how do you know you can trust God in the future? because of what he's done in the past. If you look at where he's taken us in the past, we can trust him for the future. Now, the other thing we learn about is complaining. Uh, God's people began complaining when they became fearful or uncomfortable. You think about um, the major life changes they went through. You think they did go through a lot of changes. You know, they were living in Egypt. It was slavery, but they, you know, they were living in Egypt Next thing you know, they're wandering around. And uh, when change occurs, people are tempted to grumble instead of seeing God at work. And sometimes the complaining and the grumbling might be a result of fear. And that's what that was. And so, uh, but uh, sometimes it's just a sign of just a character flaw as well. And uh, God uh, was working with them and showed them and, and chastised them and punished them even for their complaining. Uh, a couple of New Testament passages here that hit this, uh, that talk about this idea. First Peter 4, 7 through 10. Uh, Peter writes, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one, of, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Isn't it interesting? Without grumbling, another passage, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Do everything without complaining. Wouldn't it be nice if it just said, just do most stuff without complaining. You get a, no, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, and I like this, in which you shine like stars in the universe. You think about the person that you know, can you think of somebody you know that you never hear that person complain? If you think about that person, generally, aren't they a person you could say, they kind of shine like a star in the universe. They're kind of a bright spot, you know. Um, now, stewing silently is also considered a form of complaining, just so you know, all right? <laughs> but, uh, in the room here, people are just looking at each other, and you wouldn't believe it here. So, so the last thing we learn, I think this is, uh, we have, uh, the next thing it would be uh, leadership. Uh, Moses and Aaron were held to a high standard as leaders in Israel, and we, uh, we learned that leadership can be full of frustrations. And I can't imagine how frustrated Moses must have been. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. Um, my parents, uh, when I was, hadn't even finished Bible college yet, I was going to be ordained to become a minister and all of this. And, and uh, 
they ran into a person who had been a minister for many years. Uh, they were on they were on vacation down in, in Myrtle Beach, and they ran into this minister who had been there, been in ministry for maybe 40 years, and was retiring. and And uh, they uh, they said, um, "Well, what advice would you give to a young man going into ministry?" And this retired minister said, "Boy, be prepared for people to let you down." I was like, "Wow, that's pretty cynical." You know, I thought, "Man, that was cynical." But the more I thought about it, I got to thinking. I think I know what he was getting at. You know, don't ever put your complete trust in people. You always have to, ultimately, your trust has to be in God. And I've been blessed to be around some wonderful, wonderful people in, in this life. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, what we learned from Moses, people are fickle, but God is faithful. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I would be at the head of the fickle line there you know so we're, we're all there for that so you got leadership and the last one and i think a very vivid lesson you get here is a lesson on grace and that lesson on grace really is uh is shown in that story of the bronze snake in the wilderness the bronze snake in the wilderness is a symbol of god's grace there was a curse and people were dying from the curse. And what did they have to do to be healed from the curse? They had to look up to the cross. They had to look up to the bronze serpent there. So Jesus actually talked about this in the New Testament. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So you have this shadow of something greater to come. You had this thing that was lifted up that you would look to that and you would be healed from that curse, that plague. Now we look to the cross for being healed from the plague of sin and the plague of death. We've all been bitten We've all been bitten. Uh, you could almost say we've been bitten by the serpent, the evil one, as we have sinned, and there is a cure, and we look to the cross for that. So that is an overview of the book of Numbers. Again, I always hate it because we, we get into here, and there's so many like interesting stories you could tell and get into, but we've got to keep going to, to get through this. But again, if you decide to go through this as a, a three-third study, a journey group study, hopefully this, this outline, uh, this overview will, will help you there. So I want to uh, thank you for, uh, for joining in on this uh, study tonight here.